you for tuning in to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Thursday, November 28, 2013. It's Thanksgiving. Thanks for tuning in on the holiday. Tonight, we're going to have three unaired videos. And up first, it's Jordan Maxwell. He is going to talk to you about legalese and how to avoid the pitfalls that surround the legal jargon. <laughs> Maxwell, for those of you who have heard from me and know about me, uh, for those of you who don't know about me, for 53 years, starting back in 1959, I began uh, talking about secret societies and fraternal orders and, and the uh, occult world of mysticism and religion and government, all the conspiracies going on in government and banking and uh, all of the chicanery going on in religion, the connections between religion and banking and the whole entire Western civilization system, what it was based on, lies, deception, corruption. So I've been doing this, talking publicly for the last 53 years about this uh, horrible mess that the world was in and was going to get worse. Well, now at 2013, uh, it's gotten worse. I was invited to go to movie studios at night and uh, recording studios <clears throat> and just do uh, slide presentations with a slide projector on the sound stages of Hollywood talking about the um, Illuminati and secret societies and the occult world and, and the Knights Templars and the secret societies of religion and how they impact government today and it's finally, finally caught on. Finally, it has finally caught on. Um, I did a video many, many years ago called Matrix of Power I did uh, something called Matrix. I just feel that I've done the best I could to wake my fellow man up. And uh, unfortunately for me and my people who are listening to me, I know, and it is very depressing to me, that I know I'm not going to be able to, to download 53 years of knowledge that I have a you know, I've accumulated so much I will never be able to tell anyone. And I do feel that that is a shame because I've been in the company of extraordinary people all my life. I put myself there purposely. So I've been in the company of a lot of people who are masters at what they do, masters of research and knowledge and understanding. Your body is a is a corporation. That's why when you die, you're a corpse. Because you are a corporation. You are a company. And as such, you know, you may be good company, you may be bad company, but you're a company by law. It's called International Maritime Admiralty Law. The law of money, corporations, the law of the sea. You are a company, a corporation. And therefore, anything you do is business. That may not be my business, it may be your business, but it's a business by law. Therefore, anything you do, which is your business, anything you do must have a license because it's called a business license. So if you're going to get married, that means one corporation is going to do business with another corporation. So you have to have a marriage license. Anything you do, you need to get a permit or a license. And in America, you have something called the Statue of Liberty. It is not the Statue of Freedom. It's the Statue of Liberty. Liberty is what a sailor gets when he gets off a ship in the Navy. When you pull into port and you ask the captain if you can go uh, on land, if he gives you the permission, and he may not, but if you get permission to go out, you have liberty. Sailors call it, we got liberty. 
not freedom. In America, you have no freedom. You have liberty. Liberty means you ask permission. You get a permit. You have a license. A license is simply an agreement and a permit. A license is a permit to do something which without that license would be unlawful. So therefore you can't get married because you're a business. And she's a business. And what the two of you do is none of my business. But the point you need to understand is that you are a corporation. Your body is being bought and sold on the New York Stock Exchange every day and you have no idea in the world how the world really works. So people talk about having to go to court, they talk about uh, how the government does this and the government did that, and people get scared to death because they got to go to court, which you should be scared of court. But why do people go to court? Because you play basketball on a court. You play tennis on a court. Wake up. I've been talking about this stuff for 53 years, but nobody seems to listen to it very much anymore. The reason why you go to court is a game. It's like tennis. And how do you play tennis? You play with a, you play with a racket. So you, when you go into uh, a basketball game to play on the court, the whole idea is you have two teams. One team is a team of lawyers, and another team of lawyers. And the whole idea in a court, because it's maritime admiralty, international banking law, uh, the whole idea is to put the ball back in the other guy's court. So therefore that one team picks up the ball and they throw it in the over here to you. Now your team picks it up and throws the ball back over their court. And then they pick the ball back and throw it back into your court and you have a judge who's the referee. You always have a referee, even at a baseball game. You've got the you've got the uh, the referee who makes the decision as to what really happened. I don't care what happened. He decides what happened. Whatever he says happened, that's what happened. Then the next thing you need to understand is that there's a gate, a fence and a gate in the courtroom, and people sit out here and the judge sits inside. Why is there a fence and a gate? Because the gate represents a water gate like in the Panama Canal. When the gate opens, the water comes in and raises the ship up. So therefore, when you were called and you put your hand on the gate, you are opening up the flood gate under maritime admiralty law. But happily, Americans have no idea about any of this. But once you understand how this really works, and you begin to see how your body is over 70% water, and you are a maritime admiralty water product. And the way this thing is being played is very, very interesting. The words and the terms and the symbols, and your body is a biological battery. We are a biological electrical unit. Therefore, if you are walk into the court and they call your name and you open up the water gate, you are now in hot water and someone's going to have to bail you out. Once you understand that the bank and money runs the world, so the judge rules from a bench. Look up the word bench. It will tell you the word bench is a bank in Latin. Therefore, the judge rules for the bench or the bank. And the judge sits higher up. When you walk in, you'll see the judge sits up here. He's looking down on you but you're looking up to the bank, the bench. Look it up in a dictionary. When a ship pulls into a harbor, it's got like, eight, let's say, eight million dollars worth of Toyotas on the, on the damn ship. It pulls into a harbor, it's got 800 million dollars worth of business on that ship. And it comes in on water. So we, we say when the ship comes in, it parks at the dock. The ship comes in on water. $800 million worth of banking just came in on, a, on ship. This is why I said banking is maritime admiralty, the law of the sea. So therefore, if you're going to do any business, then you need to get a, you need to be part of this corporation. And the world corporation 
you have to have a you are a citizen on board ship so you have a citizenship sportsmanship scholarship um, you know dealerships courtship and anytime you order something from a big company they're going to ship it to you where a ship sits when you go to the uh, go to the harbor where a ship sits it's called berth b-e-r-t-h a ship is sitting in her berth therefore any items that come off of that ship she all ships are she always rocket ship sailing ship doesn't matter what kind of ship if it's a ship, it's she. Under international law, all ships are, are female. Why? Because she delivers the product. The man manufactures, but the woman delivers the product. So when you have been manufactured, and she, your mother, delivers the product, you are a product of two corporations. Maritime Admiralty Law. You, your mother was a corporation. Your father's a corporation. Therefore, you are the, you are the joint new product of, a, of two corporations. Ford Motor Company getting together with, with Suzuki. That's fine as long as you get a license because it's business. And anything that those two companies produce, the one who gave you the license is the boss because before that you couldn't do it at all but if the corporation gave you the permission to pre to create a new product fine but the product belongs to them not you what if i told you the government has your baby's dna and in some states that dna is stored even without your consent so once you understand that all ships are female she sits in her berth and any item taken off of that ship has to have its own certificate of manifest. It's called a certificate of manifest. And each car has to be represented. Does it have four doors, two doors, air conditioning? What color is it? How heavy is it? What, you know, this and this and that. And all the paperwork has to be correct for each item. So when you're born, it's called a birth certificate. How much did you weigh? What race is it? Did you have two eyes? Was it one arm? You know, what, what color was he, etc. Because these are all vital signs for a product. You are a human resource. You're going to be bought and sold by the international banks in New York and London. Your body is a security on the New York Stock Exchange. According to the uh, British and American, it's called, there's a book you can get from the American Printing Office or the U.S. Government Printing Office. It's called the Styles Book, Styles Magazine, or Styles Book, U.S. Printing Office Styles Manual, Styles Manual. And in the Styles Manual, published by the United States Government Printing Office, it tells you what the words mean correctly. When you go to court, and you're in a federal court, you're in an international uh, court of any kind, here are the words to use. Because the words you would use on the street don't work in a court. You better know what you're talking about when you're before a judge. You better use the correct term. Because if you use a wrong term, thinking you want, uh, that they will understand, no, now you're going to jail because you said the wrong word. So, a group of people got together back in 1871, before your grandma was born, 1871, and they formed a corporation after the Civil War. In the Civil War, they called their, their company... United States Corporation. It was a municipal corporation. And they and it was stipulated anybody who worked for the corporation is a member of the corporation. <clears throat> and so today, <clears throat> if you are a U.S. citizen, when you walk in a bank or any place, uh, you know, to uh, before some authority, and they ask you, are you a U.S. citizen? And you say yes. What you think they are asking you is are you lawfully in America to do business are you lawfully here are you an alien All right and you say no I no, I'm lawfully to be here I'm okay so then they will say well are you a US citizen and you say yes what you think you're saying is that you're saying yes I am lawfully in America that's not 
any good attorney will tell you, I'm going to ask you something under oath. Think about what I'm asking you. Because if you answer wrong, you're going to jail. Now my question is, are you of your own volition, out of your own mouth, testifying in this court that you are a U.S. citizen? And you say, well, I'm lawfully in America. Yeah, I don't have any problems here. Sure, I'm a U.S. citizen. That's what I wanted to know. Now you're going to jail. Now you go to prison. Because you're not an American. You don't have American freedom. You don't have the Bill of Rights. You're a U.S. citizen. U.S. is a privately owned corporation. That's a maritime admiralty corporation owned by a handful of men that you don't know anything about. And therefore, when you say that you're a U.S. citizen, that means I am an employee of a foreign corporation under maritime law, and therefore my boss is in Washington, D.C., and I work for him. Oh, well now, if you work for him, then you are a U.S. citizen. And according to his policies, not the law of the land, but his policy, his policy is you can't do this, this and that, it's his policy, and you just broke his policy. So that's why we have police to back up the policy that the politicians who are the owner, who are the masters of the corporation. So the masters of the corporation make the policy and police back it up. Up next is Stuart Rhodes. He's going to talk about how to prepare yourself and your community without the help of FEMA or government backup plans. This is Stuart Rhodes, founder of Oath Keepers, with an InfoWars Nightly News special report on solutions. I want to take a minute to talk to you about what you need to be doing as an American. What's most critical is you getting squared away in your neighborhood, in your family, making sure that you are prepared. It's not enough just to go vote. The powers that be want you to believe that your duties as a citizen are only to go and pull a lever for Oathbreaker B or Oathbreaker A. That's not it. A full spectrum American citizen is responsible for their personal security, for their neighbor's security, for their, for their, their town and their county, for their own preparedness, for their own food, and, and not just for you, but for your neighbors as well. That's why with Oath Keepers, we started our special program now for having the civilization preservation teams where we advocate that Oath Keepers go and teach people in neighborhood watches and in churches and within their towns and counties to get squared away and prepared and specialize in one area. Have, have each person pick you know, communications, medical or engineering. That means like clean water, alternate power, whether it's solar or, or with generators, sewage, things like that, that, are, that, all the things that break down in an emergency, whether it's man-made or natural, you need to have these core critical things taken care of. These are things that are difficult to improvise. Either you have medical supplies and knowledge or you don't. Either you have communications gear and the knowledge of how to run them or you don't. Either you have the, the ability to have alternate power and water purification or you don't. So focus on those things. Make sure you've got those covered in your own, in your own uh, family and then also in your own neighborhood. Get together with your neighbors. The most important thing you can do is to go start a neighborhood watch. That's ground zero for you. If you don't have a neighborhood watch, start one right now. If you have one, join it. Next level up is to go to all your veterans organizations and wake them up to the reality of the exposure we have as a country, the weakness we have in our economic situation and our, also our constitutional crisis we have right now. Let them know what's going on and remind them of their oath, their responsibilities as veterans to defend the Constitution. And what that means is as a veterans hall, they should organize themselves as a civil defense and disaster preparedness unit within their town. They already have officers, they've got a building, they've got money, but what are they doing with it? And they have members in that veterans hall who are trained in different occupational specialties in, in the military, different MOSs, whether they're communications, whether they're logistics, motor pool, whether they were a pilot, all of these different skills and training are useful for the community in a disaster relief situation. They need to see themselves as a unit, find out what skills they do have within that unit, and then cross-train and gear up 
so they can act as a unit together. They are the backbone for the sheriff's posse. They are the pool of people who will be there to serve as the county militia. They are there to serve as their state militia. If you can get them to actually pass a militia statute and revitalize your state militia, that'd be best. But even in, in, in a, as a stopgap, right now, your veterans in those veterans halls have the training that can be used to make sure that your community is prepared and you're not desperate and reliant only on FEMA to come in. FEMA cannot possibly take care of all of you in a nationwide emergency. There's no, there's no friggin' way they can do it. And furthermore, you don't want to be vulnerable to what we saw during Katrina, where you had people's rights being violated, all in the name of security, having their guns confiscated. If you are prepared in your community to take care of yourselves, it removes the pretext. It's much more likely that police and military will say no to unconstitutional orders, such as orders to disarm you, if you have things covered, if you have your own community taken care of and you don't need outside help. If you're not desperate, it's much more likely they'll look at that and go, wait a minute, Mr. President, they don't need our help, they don't want our help, so why are you ordering us to go in there and declare martial law or disarm the American people? It's, more, it's much more likely they'll say no. So that's why it's critical that you remove the pretext by getting as squared away as possible. And we advocate that you kind of use the, the Special Forces 18 model as a model for how to do this. So they've got two specialists in each of those critical fields, two medics, two communications experts, two engineers, and then they have security personnel to watch over them. The same thing can be used by you in your neighborhood. You don't have to join Oath Keepers to do this. We will be doing this within, within our chapters, of course, as a working model leading by example, but you can do it right now in your own family. Decide who's gonna specialize in medical, who's gonna specialize in communications, who's gonna specialize in power, and who's gonna specialize in security. And then work that together, become a team, and then spread that same, that same message to your neighbors and out to your churches, your churches the same way, your veterans halls, then your counties and towns. And of course, if you have a volunteer fire department or search and rescue unit, you should join them. If there's a sheriff's posse in your area, you should join that. If you don't have one of those things, start them. Start a search and rescue unit, start a sheriff's posse, and encourage your fellow Americans to go join it. Any of these things you have that are public institutions, make them stronger. So you consider it like two pillars going up. On the one side you have official action or quasi-official, like a volunteer fire department created by the county, or a sheriff's posse under command of the sheriff. Any of these things you do have, reserve deputy programs, go and join them. But at the same time, and of course encourage your towns and your counties to establish you know, civil defense units, to establish town and county militias, and then ultimately a state militia by statute. Do all those things if you can, but don't put all your eggs in one basket. Also on the private side, do a neighborhood watch, get your church squared away. Your church should be doing what the Mormon church does, storing food and helping people prepare. If your church is not doing that, they're dropping the ball. Go to your veterans organizations. It's all private actions you can take as a private individual among your fellow Americans in the private column to get prepared. Do that at the same time while you try to get your official you know, structures of government to do the right thing. And again, of course, the critical element is a sheriff. If you have a constitutional sheriff in your county that you can back him up with a, with a, with a posse, that's your best solution, your best effort you can focus on right now when it comes to that, that public column. But don't wait only for that. While you're working on that, start a neighborhood watch. And the best way to do that is throw a block party for your neighborhood and invite everyone in the neighborhood to turn out and have fun together. And then you get to know your neighbors, you get to know who the retired cop is, who the retired nurse or doctor or firefighter, you get to know all the veterans in the community. You'll find out your special skills you already have in your own neighborhood. And then you can approach them about being on a neighborhood watch or at least being on a list of those that, that you can alert when things are going bad and call on them. You might not get them to step up right now to be in the neighborhood watch. So consider it like this. What you're trying to do is at least find a skeleton crew or a framework of those specialists, the medical, the communications, and the engineering. So even if you only had six, seven, a dozen people who are really willing to prepare ahead of time, that's the nucleus for your broader community neighborhood watch or disaster relief squad when the time, when the time comes. So in an emergency, when an emergency hits, if you've got 
emergency power already lined up, if you've got medical care and communications, you can improvise everything else. You can improvise the search and rescue or improvise the shelter and improvise the security. That can be improvised, but it's difficult to improvise on the fly, medical or engineering or commo. That's why you focus on those three critical areas. And the other big one that's hard to improvise is food. Either you got food or you don't. It's kind of hard to, to do that on the fly. So you need to store away food, even just the basics, rice and beans and oatmeal, you can, you can cook with just hot water. Store that aside, not just for you, but also for your neighbors. Have bags of rice and beans in your closet. Consider it a strategic food reserve. Consider it a military necessity, a national security necessity, a community necessity for you to have that. Like a tithing in church, 10% of your food storage should be for your neighbors. And all of you need to understand that you, you, you need to do what we used to have. We used to have three years worth of grain reserve in this country during the Cold War because it was obvious and understood that if there was a nuclear exchange, it would take three years, potentially, to grow fruit again. Well, the same could happen now with an economic collapse or any other major catastrophe. You can have a serious interruption in food. It may take you a year or two to be able to grow food again. Imagine if there's an EMP, whether man-made or natural. That could do the same thing. Knock out the power grid, throw us back in the 19th century again for over a year. So you should be storing away, the Mormons are correct, you should store away at least a year's worth of basics, rice and beans, oatmeal, wheat, things that are really cheap and easy to store, and then three months worth of your own groceries you use all the time. That's, that's the, the LDS model. They want you to store away the food you're going to use anyway and cycle through, but also have the basics. But store it for your neighbors too. If your neighbors are desperate and hungry, they're much more likely to submit the tyranny and to turn you in. So make sure that you provide for your neighbors. You can't just be a selfish prepper who says, only for me and mine, and screw my neighbor. Live, live the ethic of love your neighbor and prepare to feed them as well. If you do this, if you take the responsibility for your own security and for your neighbor's security and start to grow your own food again and store, you store food for yourselves and take personal responsibility for your security, you will be a strong, resilient people who are not easy to manipulate with fear and disaster. If you don't do this and you continue to just be weak and impotent and unable to take care of yourselves, then you'll be vulnerable for the manipulation of the elites. This is Stuart Rhodes with OathKeepers.org. You can find more about the civilization preservation teams by going to OathKeepers.org. We have it right there at the top of our site, all the information you need to know about it to get started. And last up, we have a little comedic relief with Ari Shafir. for the very hilarious, the reason we're all here, Mr. Ari Shafir, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I've been in comedy for almost 15 years, 14 and a half years. I usually, I go to Canada a lot. I don't really leave the country that much. I went to, I went to Australia uh, uh, about a month ago. So that was cool. And I went to Cabo, Mexico. But those don't count. Mexico and Canada don't count. If they say, are you opting out? I was like, I don't know what that means. And I say, do you not want that? Or do you want a pat down? I go, no, I don't want a pat down, but I'm not doing that thing. So what are my options? Are you just trying to be Larry David? No, I'm just trying to not let them take away these freedoms from me without going down with a little bit of a fight. I see what they're doing. They're just harassing us. And I don't want to just let them do it. This one joke I have, I asked them to raise your hand if you support the government right now. I think that was the only time I've done it like that. Uh, I just figured Austin's kind of a political town. So I bet, I just, you know, I just kind of want to get the sense of like, how, how much is it right now? Because sometimes you get a few people clapping, you know? Um, and sometimes you get a lot, like people love the government. I talked to my mom recently about Snowden. I was like, what do you think of him? She goes, well, I mean, it's, it's a, he's a traitor. And I was like, huh, why, why do you say that? She goes, well, he put the country in jeopardy. I'm like, in what way? And she was like, I don't know. He just did. He, he told them secrets. I'm like, who? He, that they were spying on us. She's like, well, no, we're, it, it hurts us. And I'm like, what news story you could appoint to exactly that, t that justifies that? <laughs> and she just sort of buys it. She's just like, here's, oh, I heard on the news. I mean, the idea of having debates would strengthen us, but I don't think having polarizing views helps us at all. I think it's just like, well, you guys break off and do your sh We're nothing like you. It's like gay people want to be part of the church. It's like, what are you talking about? They don't like you. They don't want you there. Stop trying to get them to accept you. Just do your own thing. Yeah, I think those people that, are like, that want to like, like love Jesus and all that and the heartland and do whatever they want to do, the real conservative people, it's like, go do your own thing. No, it doesn't help us get anywhere. 
People are like, you got to respect other people's religions. I'm like, why? You're supposed to disrespect their religion. That's what it means to believe in your God, that you don't believe in their God. You think it's silly and stupid. It's cool. You want to smoke weed in your, in, your, in, your, in your apartment? Do it. If you want to, as a government, say, we don't think weed should be legal, it's like, all right, that's fine. But you can't take away my freedom. You can't make me surrender my freedom because I lit up a joint in my bathroom while I'm taking a dump. So I have to not be free for a year after that? I don't understand how that's helping anything. Put heavy taxes on it, something like that, if you want to like, get rid of it. You can't make, make it go. It doesn't go away when you make something illegal. It doesn't go away. Just like murder never goes away. Yeah, all the war on drugs. I mean, everybody kind of knows the ways, but everyone still feels like they have to fight it. They still have to feel like, well, we can't just let it go rampant. But it's like, you know what they did in Portugal? They legalized all drugs. They took the exact amount of dollars they were spending on the drug war in Portugal, and they put that exact money into treatment, into drug treatment. So just like alcoholics, some people can drink booze. Most people can. But some people become alcoholics and they can't treat it. We need to help them with treatment. That's what it means to, to reach out to them. We don't have to make it illegal. It doesn't go away when you make it illegal. So same thing with drugs. Most people can... Dude, I know I got told when I was young, if you do coke, you're going to lose your family and your house and your, and your wife and job. But, and it stuck with me. I'm not really a coke guy because of that. I've done it like twice. But I have all these friends who do coke all the time and they're fine. They're getting ahead. They're doing well. So it's like, it's not gone, and it's not the thing you told us. So for the people who can't handle it, yeah, get treatment. Get education ahead of time. This might be addictive for you. Yeah, well, of course you should use it as, as a treatment. The problem is now you can't research it because it's illegal to have. So you can't even do the research in order to show that it's good. You can't get any funding. You can't do it publicly. You have to go to another country to do that research. Like, small amounts of research have helped, have shown. John Hopkins had a study that showed it, like, uh, psilocybin relieves uh, stress and, um, and uh, depression and it gives people among the five most spiritual moments of their lives. And so it's like, should we not even continue to research it? Well, it's illegal. Just see, maybe we got it wrong. Maybe we lump something in. People are like, oh, mushrooms are drugs. No, they're not. That's not drugs. Meth is drugs. A lot of people do political comedy and I've almost always seen it done wrong. They lose the idea of uh, being funny. Bill Hicks was completely unfunny when he was doing this political stuff. He w completely just ignored the idea of laughs. All the best clips that everybody quotes me, there's two laughs in seven minutes. There's nothing there. Doug Stanhope does it well. Doug Stanhope never forgets that. He'll continue to talk about his point, but he'll make jokes throughout. He doesn't go 30 seconds without a joke. He definitely doesn't go four minutes without one. Yeah, Stanhope does it well. This guy Dave Smith in, LA, in uh, New York is doing it well. Real libertarian comic. But he doesn't, a lot of times comics just, they preach at you. They just do stuff like this, like, well, how could, when the, how, of course the Fed was built in 1962, what do you think happens? And people are like, I don't know what that means. So this, it's not, this isn't a joke, you're just yelling. You can make points too, but make jokes. That's your, that's your first thing. So do you think people can actually learn something from comics? Yeah, here or there, absolutely. You get somebody else's point of view. I had on my special, I had this anti-family like family stuff. Like, I don't want kids, and I, I feel like I got my point across in a way to make a joke, and it's like, hey, it might not be for you to have no kids ever, but you'll hear it, maybe it's an option. You know, if you're 22, maybe you'll hear like, oh, maybe I don't have to think in terms of like, success is only having a wife and ch child. Maybe success is something different. People can relate to you on anything you do. So if you say like, I wet my bed, or whatever, you know, you'll, the, wed the bed wetters will relate to you, but also people went through like, insecurities will relate to you. People who overcame hurdles will relate to you. You know, same sort of thing. Yeah, people can learn from other people's experiences, of course. Yeah, that's why Hemingway went to war. You know, he wasn't writing to just veterans. He was writing to the normal person, but he was like, you'll relate to it. Any kind of art, people, anything that's out there. So it's constantly, like I, like I told you, I don't know how you can relate to politics, but you can totally. But like when I go anti-children and stuff, the reason people have that idea is like, this is, I have to have a family, have to, is because romantic comedies. Because it always works out, and that's what your ideal is, and you keep trying to strive for that. Because that's in media. That's in entertainment, constantly. Even sitcoms. Except for Seinfeld, and even they tried that first year. Larry David had to quit over it. Larry David had to quit Seinfeld. Because he was like, Elaine and, J and Jerry are not supposed to get together. We're not doing that show. And they were like, nah, we just think, you know, that's a natural, that's how shows work. And he goes, no. It's ridiculous. People are going to just be friends. And uh, that's just never shown. It and so when the more you show it, the more it becomes acceptable to you and your friends. They're like, yeah, it's, it's done. I went, on a, I went on an anonymous march in L.A. They had the uh, A Million Mask March. 
It was great. I mean, nobody gets the message, though. Nobody hears it. When you go by people, they look at you and they're like, oh, what's that? Oh, it's Muscle and Anonymous people. And maybe a couple people go, well, let me look at that. And they find out what it is. But no, everyone just says there's someone protesting. Same thing I do when I hear honks, somebody post. I'm like, I just, I don't take it in. I don't think what's the message. And then you just yell, wake up, wake up. And it's like, yeah, maybe they should, but that ain't going to do it. That ain't going to accomplish what you're doing. And honestly, I don't even know what you're trying to accomplish anyway. Let's say everybody wakes up. Let's say everybody wakes up and they know the government is completely corrupt and it's all just Game of Thrones. It's all the same shit as it's always been. And they know that the Fed controls everything and they've assassinated every president or tried to assassinate every president that's ever questioned the Fed. Then what if we all wake up? We're still powerless. We still can't. By saying I want to change, that's not going to make it change. That's not. There's one way. There's one way to make regime change in any country. And you all know what it is. It's not through voting. It's not through waking up. We all know what it is. While there are actually productive and peaceful ways to change the government and change this weird society that we're living in, that is to educate yourself on the world that is around you. Vote for representatives that are going to represent those ideals that you want to create. And also vote with your dollars, and especially remember that during this holiday season. Thank you so much for tuning in to the InfoWars Nightly News. We'll see you here tomorrow. This is a conspiracy by the technocrats, by the ruling elite, by the eugenicists that want to dumb us down. This is the iodine conspiracy. Our government wasn't always a eugenicist-based predatory group. Back in the 1920s, the federal government pressured salt manufacturers and bread producers to add iodine because they knew that iodine deficiencies were causing massive decreases in IQ, birth defects, and it was a health crisis all across the United States and in Europe as well. In the decade after iodine was added to staple foods, there was a 15 point increase in IQs in the areas that had previously been deficient. So what did the federal government do a couple decades later? They took the good halogen iodine out and added another bad one, bromine. And they put the worst of the group, fluoride and fluorine derivatives, in our water supply and began using it as a pesticide on the crops. Let's be clear about this. Adding bromine to the food supply is banned in the EU, banned in Canada, and banned in many other nations because it is a toxic poison listed in those countries. I've done deep research on the globalist program to dumb down the population to make us more manageable. It is eugenics. And I personally take the highest quality form of unbound iodine, nascent iodine, in a kosher certified, non-GMO certified glycerin base. I've interviewed the experts, people like Dr. Brownstein and pharmacist Ben Fuchs, and of course, Dr. Edward Group, and across the board, the consensus is iodine is the missing piece of the puzzle. And not just iodine, but high quality, unbound, pure iodine. Bottom line, this is something on record our bodies need. I've gone out and found the best source for myself and my family. I hope you'll visit InfoWarsLife.com and get our InfoWars Life Survival Shield. It really does incredible things. And we've got nothing but positive reviews from our listeners. And this also helps support our news operation and the InfoWar while we get the iodine we need and block the fluoride and the other members of the halogen that are so bad for our bodies check out the information. Do the research for yourself. Talk to your physician and then decide whether you want to drink fluoridated water that Harvard major studies admits is giving people brain cancer and bone cancer and lowering their IQ or whether you want to find a high quality source of iodine. Consult your physician, do your research and make a decision. But whatever you do, don't just ignore this message because all of my research shows this is absolutely key to getting people out of the brain fog that they've been artificially put into by the social engineers. Visit InfoWarsLife.com today. Now you can watch The Alex Jones Show live as it happens at InfoWars.com show.
You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. More than 60 movies and documentaries all in one place at InfoWars.com show.